Well, let's think a little bit about the symptoms of relapse. Uh, one of the things, of course, you always hear about MS is that no two people with MS are the same, and, and you said it, there's no average MS. There's no average MS relapse either because they can take such a variety of forms, and we really must be good clinicians in order to recognize what are the hallmarks of an MS relapse. Um, Joe, maybe you can take us through a little bit of the sort of characteristic symptoms of relapse. What do we look for? What gets our attention? Okay, so again, this gets to the capricious nature of this illness uh, because it can really take many different forms. To begin with, it may be monosymptomatic or polysymptomatic. So the patient may present with just one isolated event uh, confined to a particular area of the brain, or it may be um, something that encompasses more than one symptom. And the things that we often see are changes in vision. So it's not uncommon for somebody to tell you that they have pain behind an eye, uh, their vision's blurred or they're losing vision, symptomatic of optic neuritis. Uh, paresthesias, numbness, sensory complaints, quite common as a manifestation of a relapse. It could be a motor feature, it could be weakness of one side or both sides, uh, of both legs, for instance, difficulty with gait. Uh, it may be in coordination uh, or double vision. So, and it may be some of these things in combination with one another. So there's really no simple uh, way of defining relapse by symptoms. It could be virtually anything. There are certain things, though, that are quite unlikely to be relapses. So it's, it's unusual, it may occur, but it's unusual for somebody to come in and say have uh, new severe cognitive complaints as, as a relapse. Uh, it's unusual for them to come in with any cortical features. Uh, so there are certain things that you can distinguish, and uh, the clinician must bear in mind that even in individuals that have defined, uh, well-recognized multiple sclerosis, the symptoms that they're presenting with may not be related to multiple sclerosis. Yeah. I think that that's a very important point. A any additional thoughts from, from both of you about the kinds of symptoms that get your attention or, or that you would pursue as a possible MS relapse? Well, one of the things I think that's really important in terms of diagnosis of MS is to listen to the patient. Um, I do a lot of phone management in our very large, big academic practice and very often people will call in and they're telling me things over the phone and it's, I think, really important to listen to what they say and how they say it and then ask appropriate questions to tease out things. And I usually wind up that call asking them if they have any infections, if they have fevers, anything that may be changed abruptly, even something as simple as a, as a change in their exercise routine where they're doing perhaps more cardio now than they were in the past, building up core body temperature and having symptoms come and go that might be very different for them. If, if you listen and ask the appropriate questions, you get that gut and then, as Joe said, go with it. I think that's a great point. Uh, Sam, any, any other great questions you like to ask to, to tease out relapses? Uh, I always ask, have you had this before? Sure. Because I think it's a very, a very easy to problem solve if you've already gone through And Many times these contacts are outside of office hours or they're calling from emer uh, an emergency department or urgent care. And if this is a problem you've dealt with, then there's a problem. Now, I like to know what medicines they're on because usually it tells me a lot about how I've been managing them, even if I don't have a medical record in front of me. So, so I think Sam makes a very important point, and I think uh, it needs to be expanded on a little bit. So when a, when a patient calls and says, yes, I've had this symptom before, one of the things I always ask is, well, how long has that symptom been present? Yeah. Because uh, we, th there, it's not uncommon for individuals who've had symptoms to have transient manifestations, the same symptoms, as a consequence of physiological changes. So uh, there's a phenomenon called Uthoff's phenomenon, described well over 100 years ago by a German neurologist, uh, of people who would exercise and have uh, recurrence of their symptoms, but they'd be short-lived, you know, it'd be 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and then it'd be gone. And we hear this all the time from people who've been in either hot environments. Recall that prior to the MRI, we had something called the hot bath test where we put people in a hot bath. Medical students are, are very intrigued when we tell them that, that we actually did this to people. You know, they think it's barbaric, but we would raise their core body temperature 
and we'd examine them before and after because they'd have transient manifestations. These are symptoms as well as signs. Right. So this was in the era before hot yoga also. That's now, true. Now yeah. people do this to themselves. Precisely, <laughs> precisely, before hot yoga. So, so the, the question then is, when somebody tells you, I've had this symptom before, is how long is it lasting? If, if it's something that is short-lived, if it's less than 24 hours, we generally not, don't regard it as a relapse. I would say the other big thing that I encounter is patients who call in and everything is worse. So across every domain of function that you can think of, you know, they have blurry vision, they have foggy thinking, they're dropping things, their legs feel weak, they feel numb all over. And in these people who have global um, kind of decompensation of neurological function, um, my, uh, my suspicion that there's a focal bona fide relapse at play is actually low. Yeah. And it's more likely a secondary factor that's involved. And if you ask enough questions, sure enough, you end up finding out that this person has an upper respiratory tract infection that they're recovering from, or has not been getting sleep recently because they changed shifts at their job, or they've been under a tremendous amount of uh, stress, something like this. And I think that's another piece that, that throws people is it often seems like very severe manifestations. Therefore, people are worried about the patient, especially people in urgent care or you know, emergency settings. Um, but in fact, we actually go hunting for non-MS um, contributors to global symptom uh, exacerbations. You know, two, two things to say about that. One, I know you've done some work uh, with your group at the Cleveland Clinic looking at that and how when MS patients come to the emergency room, often it's for those other things that deplete the person's ability to compensate, such as urinary tract infections. So you have a nice algorithm for that, I know, at Cleveland Clinic. It also speaks to me, uh, anyone who knows me in this field knows that what I've worked on is something called the topographical model of MS, where the lesion burden that a patient accumulates is compensated for by reserve. And things that globally deplete reserve transiently, like overheating um, or uh, a superimposed infection, bring down that ability to compensate that transiently, physiologically drains reserve. And all of a sudden, all those same symptoms are present again above the clinical threshold. So I'm, I share your view that in that setting, it's not as likely to be a relapse and more likely to be something that's globally affecting that person's reserve and ability to compensate. 